Jonathan, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be speaking at this uh, incredibly prestigious uh, research conference. Um, the paper that I have uh, written for this conference is called The Case for Money Finance, an essentially political issue. And at the core of the paper, I have made a distinction between the technical feasibility of monetary finance and the political risks. By technical feasibility, I mean to address the issue of whether we would be in favor of monetary policy if we could assume that political authorities could make credible commitments only to use it in appropriate circumstances and appropriate amounts. Would it then be technically feasible? And then I'm also going to discuss the issue of whether such credible commitments can ever be made. And the conclusion I am going to make is that in terms of the technical feasibility of monetary finance, there is no real doubt within economic theory that monetary finance can stimulate aggregate nominal demand, that we can control by how much it stimulates nominal demand, uh, and that in some circumstances it might be a better way to do it than all the other techniques that we try to use. And I'm going to make that as a challenge to say, can anybody come up with a technical reason why that isn't true? But then I'm going to address the issue of, but can we deal with the politics? But actually, most of my comments are going to be on the technical side, simply because I think to a surprising extent, that technical proposition, that it is possible and potentially optimal, is not entirely accepted. I better start by being clear what I mean by monetary finance. What we mean by is fiscal deficits or increased fiscal deficits higher than they would otherwise be financed by permanent money creation. The intuitively easy way to think about it is in terms of uh, Milton Friedman's helicopter money analogy. But in the real world, we could be talking about a one-off tax cut or a one-off public expenditure, which is financed by the permanent creation of monetary base, central bank uh, monetary uh, reserves, reserves on the liability side uh, of the central bank. In terms of how you mechanically do that, there are a number of different ways that you can do that. You can either directly the central bank credit, a current account that the government holds, or the government can issue interest-bearing debt, which the central bank then buys and turns into an irredeemable, non-interest-bearing, due-from-government asset, or the government can issue a debt and the central bank buys it, receives the interest on it, returns to the government uh, the interest of central bank profits and perpetually rolls it over. But the crucial thing to realize is that those choices of how you mechanically do it don't make a difference to the fundamental fact that what you end up with is monetary base, which is an irredeemable, non-interest bearing liability of the consolidated public sector and because irredeemable and non-interest bearing, a liability which has a net present value of zero. I think it is also useful in background to just be absolutely clear up front the difference between such an operation and other operations that we might think about, such as debt finance deficits, quantitative easing, or a combination of debt finance deficits and quantitative easing in terms of the current year fiscal deficit, the public debt stock, and the monetary base either temporary or permanent. And a crucial point I want to make is that a money finance deficit is a variant of fiscal stimulus. It is a fiscal stimulus, but it is a fiscal stimulus financed with money, not with debt. With those definitions in place, I have four propositions. One, that there exist circumstances in which it is appropriate to stimulate aggregate nominal demand. Two, that monetary finance will always stimulate aggregate nominal demand. Three, that in some circumstances it will do so more certainly and with less side effects than available alternative policies. And four, that the degree of stimulus can be controlled. Now actually of those four, I think the first is actually the most debatable. I mean, I happen to agree with it, but I think you could take a different point of view. And I think there are some people increasingly, for instance, in the BIS who are taking a different point of view and are saying, well, what's wrong with mild deflation? Why do we need uh, an increase in aggregate nominal demand? But I simply want to make the case that if you don't agree with Proposition 1, then none of the other policies that we've been following over the last seven years or which are proposed are appropriate either. 
If you don't agree with Proposition 1, we shouldn't have been running large fiscal deficits, debt finance fiscal deficits. We shouldn't have been running ultra-loose uh, monetary policy. So I'm going to assume that Proposition 1 is correct and say if Proposition 1 is correct, if there are circumstances in which we want to stimulate aggregate nominal demand, what are the alternative merits of money finance versus the available alternatives? The other crucial point to say in background is, of course, that when we stimulate aggregate nominal demand, that could either have a price or an output effect. And I'm beginning by assuming, and my paper begins by assuming, that the balance between the price and output effect is independent of the policy mechanism by which you produce the stimulus to aggregate nominal demand. I will later question that and ask whether there might be expectational channels where what happens on the right-hand side is actually somewhat influenced by the left. The first proposition is the most straightforward. Money finance will always stimulate nominal demand because it is a fiscal stimulus where there is no possibility of a Ricardian equivalent offset. Absolutely definitively, monetary finance increases the household nominal net worth. As many of you may know, there is a great debate in the literature as to whether debt-financed uh, fiscal deficits do or do not increase household net worth fully understood. This goes back to Robert Barrow and his famous article on whether government debt, public debt, is household net worth. But the reason for saying that, household, that government bonds are not necessarily household net worth is the Ricardian equivalence fact that people anticipate uh, the debt servicing burden in the future. With money finance, there is no debt servicing burden in the future. And I'm going to move on very quickly from that because I think this is the bit of the argument which should be absolutely clear. I think it's been brilliantly uh, illustrated in a formal paper by Willem Beuter. Uh, but my basic assumption is if we use money finance of fiscal deficits, it will, in all circumstances that you can possibly specify, stimulate, increase the level of aggregate nominal demand. And that in itself, by the way, has an important implication. And the implication is that faced with inadequate nominal demand, governments and central banks never run out of ammunition. So we should never say that we face a problem of deficient nominal demand and there is no answer to it. There will always be an answer because there is always this answer, which means that if we end up facing a secular stagnation for demand rather than supply reasons, or a lowflation or a perpetual deflation, that is always a policy choice and never an unavoidable necessity. The second proposition, no, the third proposition, is that money finance, under certain circumstances, is either more effective or more desirable than the alternatives. In relation to the relationship with debt-financed fiscal deficits, it's quite straightforward. They are exactly the same as debt-financed fiscal deficits, but they create no future debt servicing burden and therefore no danger of a Ricardian equivalent offset. It is therefore absolutely definitively the case that we can write on the top line there that in terms of their impact on aggregate nominal demand, money finance deficits are greater than or equal to debt financed fiscal deficits. That's absolutely clear. Uh, I don't think that is controvertible at all. Indeed, it's interesting that Milton Friedman actually said it in 1948, or he almost said it. He said, it is said that in a period of unemployment, it is less deflationary to issue securities in order to fund a deficit than to levy taxes. That is true, but it is still less deflationary to issue money. It wasn't quite right because he didn't put the or equal to in it. Uh, the formal statement is greater than or equal to, not greater, but I think it is clear. As for the comparison with ultra-loose monetary policy, you can't express it in a straightforward greater than or equal to uh, proposition, but I think it is clear that money finance deficits are more certain to produce a stimulus to nominal demand than various forms of ultra-loose monetary policy. My paper discusses, I won't go through in detail here, how it compares with, for instance, those mechanisms of forward guidance by which we attempt to use forward guidance about the future path of either inflation or nominal interest rates to move the economy 
onto a path of faster nominal income growth. Uh, that is an issue extensively uh, explored, for instance, in Michael Woodford's uh, work at Jackson Hole in 2012 or his paper with Gauti Edgerton uh, in 2003. But I set out uh, in uh, my paper a set of arguments for believing that although forward guidance and mechanisms like it create the possibility of a path to a higher nominal demand growth equilibrium, they do not leave us certain that that path is achievable, whereas monetary finance will always stimulate aggregate nominal demand. As for the comparison with quantitative easing, um, well, again, and I think Mori said it already, one of the great issues on, monetary, on quantitative easing is well, exactly what the transmission mechanisms are. Uh, I believe that those transmission mechanisms, or, although if you do it on a large enough scale, you'll produce an effect, are somewhat indirect and have some adverse side effects. And again, I therefore argue money finance under certain circumstances has an advantage. The one monetary policy which I think will always stimulate aggregate nominal demand is actually the one now proposed by Ken Rogoff, which is that we should abolish paper money and move nominal interest rates to a seriously negative level. But there, I think that the fundamental argument against pursuing that course is that you are relying on a mechanism to stimulate aggregate nom nominal demand which only works by re-stimulating the growth of private credit. And one of the reasons why we are in this incredibly difficult deflationary trap is precisely because we created too much private credit in the upswing of the cycle. And therefore, it is a bit ironic to say that the only way out of the trap we're in is to repeat uh, the process that got us into the mess in the first place. So I think there are arguments for believing that this is a superior mechanism in some circumstances to all of the alternatives. I think it is also important to be clear how it is distinguished from a policy of simultaneously doing large debt financed fiscal deficits and doing large QE operations. Because I have to say that there was once one fairly senior uh, policy uh, uh, leader in the world who fundamentally said to me, Adair, why are you raising this tricky issue? We're running large deficits and we're doing lots of QE and if you point out uh, that this might be monetary finance, all you'll do is scare the horses and bring a set of conservative politicians down on our necks and we won't be able to do it. However, there is an important difference and the difference is about intent. If the stated intent of a QE operation is that the bonds will eventually be sold off the central bank balance sheet back into the private market, then you still have a future debt servicing requirement. And if you believe that there is any degree of rational forward-looking expectations and therefore a Ricardian equivalent effects, that means that a combination of a debt finance deficit plus QE cannot be as stimulative as a money finance deficit where you make clear that the money finance is permanent. My fourth proposition is that the degree of stimulus can be managed. And this, I think, is really the crux of what people worry about with money finance. They say, yes, of course it will stimulate nominal demand, but don't we face some sort of knife-edge non-linearity? Don't we start doing it and then we, as it were, go from deflation to hyperinflation? That's what worries people. I put forward the argument that there is no knife-edge non-linearity. There is no binary choice here between deflation and hyperinflation. That money finance and fiscal deficits is an instrument which we can calibrate and manage. I think that is very clear if you were to do a thought experiment in the simple helicopter money uh, environment. Uh, and suppose that the Federal Reserve and the government together made a credible commitment that what it was about to do was one-off. And it either dropped from a helicopter $10 million bills or $100 billion or $10 trillion. I think it is pretty intuitive that the $10 million would produce an a impact on aggregate nominal demand so small that we wouldn't even see it in the figures, that the $100 billion would produce an appreciable increase, and that the $10 trillion would produce a very high rate of inflation sustained over many years. Now, the crucial issue of what I said there was a credible commitment. Because the thing that could change it is if, having done it once, everybody believes it's going to be repeated in future. Because if it is going to be repeated in future, then it becomes rational for people to spend as rapidly as possible 
not only that 10 million or 10 billion or 10 trillion, but also all their pre-existing money cash balances. So the expectation route is crucial. And one of the crucial issues we have to consider with monetary finance is, is it the case that when you do monetary finance, you inevitably create the expectation that there will be more monetary finance and does that therefore break my previous independence hypothesis and mean that money finance will produce more of a price effect and less of an output effect than alternative ways of stimulating nominal demand. Now I argue that it needn't be, that there is no fundamental reason why we should not credibly commit that a money finance operation is one-off. But that's why the politics of this are crucial. If you can credibly commit to that, then it is a calibratable, manageable tool. That is, I think, clearly the case in the simple, imagined, Friedmanite world of a helicopter money drop. I think it is also the case when we introduce the complexity of a real world with fractional reserve banks and therefore a banking multi money multiplier. It does get more complicated in this environment because the danger is that you do your initial stimulus and increase the monetary base and at some future point that can be multiplied by the banking multiplier. But I argue that that can be controlled if we reintroduce to the central bank toolkit the tool of quantitative reserve requirements which limit the size of the banking multiplier. There is another crucial issue here which is how are reserves at the central bank remunerated? Because if we basically do a monetary base operation, uh, expansion of the monetary base, but then always remunerate that monetary base at the policy rate, then we reintroduce into our analysis an element of Ricardian equivalence because at the consolidated public sector, there still is an interest uh, expense. But again, I argue that there is a way around that, that it is completely possible for central banks to require a certain level of minimum reserve requirements to remunerate those at zero while remunerating reserve reserves above that at the marginal policy rate as an instrument to bring the policy rate and market rates in line with where they want. So to come towards the conclusion, I argue that this is completely technically feasible, that there are no valid technical reasons for excluding money finance from our policy toolkit, that it always stimulates nominal demand, and that it is technically possible for us to manage the degree of stimulus. It's technically possible to say we've currently got nominal demand growing at 2% and we've got inflation at 0.5% and that's below the targets we want and we're going to use this to bring it up to the level we want inflation up to target without that committing us to uh, an excessive level. I think the technical case is clear, but I entirely accept that there are huge political dangers. And the political dangers are that this is a medicine which tastes too sweet because it appears costless. And once you've done it once, once you've told the politicians that this is possible, how do we make sure that they will only use it in specific appropriate circumstances and in appropriate amounts rather than in continually uh, and in excessive amounts. And so whereas I do not think that there is a justified technical argument against monetary finance, I think there's a completely respectable argument which says although money finance is technically feasible and in some circumstances technically the best policy, we should nevertheless exclude its use entirely in order to avoid political risks. And that is essentially what we have done by putting a taboo around the use of monetary finance. However, in order to decide whether that's the attitude you take, you have to answer two questions. One, could we constrain the political risks? And two, how much are we giving up if we don't have this tool available. In terms of whether we can constrain the political risks, I argue that there is no fundamental reason why we should not structure a set of rules and responsibilities which locate the use of this instrument within an independent central bank, an independent and inflation targeting central bank. So that, for instance, I think we could have said to the UK Monetary Policy Committee in 2009, you have the authority 
not only to propose, if you want, three, and to execute, if you want, 375 billion of QE, which is reversible, but to approve that the maximum amount of monetary finance will be a much smaller figure, let's suppose a tenth, 375 billion of additional fiscal stimulus financed with permanent money creation. There is no political reason why we should not structure that as our rule and disciplines. What you actually spend the money on will almost certainly have to be somewhat determined by the government because you can't actually have the central bank saying well, we're going to have this specific tax cut or we're going to build these particular bridges. But as Ben Bernanke said when he proposed precisely this policy in his famous 2003 speech in Japan, a degree of coordination between the fiscal and monetary authorities in the details of such an operation do not get in the way of the independence of a central bank to approve the maximum amount. Finally, I therefore argue we can structure a set of rules and responsibilities that places this tool with discipline. The other question is, how much are we giving up if we don't allow this tool? And again in my paper, I put forward the argument that we may be in circumstances where because of a combination of the scale of the debt overhang after 2008, as it were, the Ken Rogoff hypothesis, and the possible additional element of a sort of demand secular stagnation, the Larry Summers hypothesis, if both of those or some combination is the case, and I think they may well be, then we may be in an environment where no other policy is going to pull us out of the deflationary trap that we were in and therefore excluding this possibility for fear that we might overuse it uh, will have a major adverse effect on our ability to pursue optimal policies. Thank you.